Once again, it's our great delight and privilege to uh, welcome Dr. Timothy George, the Dean of Beeson Divinity School here in Birmingham, uh, to give the second of the Nevin Lectures, the title being, Being Baptized More and More, Luther on Baptism in the Christian Life. Welcome, Dr. George. Thank you, Dr. Lightheart, and I'm delighted to see so many of you who came back, and maybe some of you for the first time, for an intensive marathon of lectures on sacramental theology from a Baptist perspective. I think it would please uh, John Williamson Nevin that there is a Baptist lecturer speaking on Martin Luther in a Presbyterian church <laughs> in the second of these Nevin lectures. Well, um, I want to begin with an event that happened on November the 10th, 1483. That was the day Martin Luther was born. He was born in the Saxon town of Eisleben. On the day following his birth, November the 11th, his parents, Hans and Margarete Luther, took their infant son to St. Peter's Church, a short walk from their house, where he was baptized by Pastor Bartholomeus Rennebecker. That's a German name for you. Baptized in a baptismal font that has been restored and can still be seen in the Taufkapelle, the baptism chapel, of the church today. I've seen it. November 11 was and still is the feast day of St. Martin of Tours. And the little baptized boy was named Martinus after the famous saint. Martin Luther was the last medieval Christian, not the first modern man. To put it that way is to take sides in a fierce debate that was raging among German theologians and historians in the early 20th century. Karl Hall, the leader of the Luther Renaissance, saw Luther as the great pioneer of modern consciousness, the champion of individualism and anti-institutionalism, a free conscience, here I stand so help me God, echoing Hegel's assessment of Luther as the all-illuminating sun which arose in the Reformation to dispel the darkness of the superstition and spiritual bondage of the dark ages. On the other side of that debate was Ernst Trelch, a brilliant scholar, though wrong-headed in almost everything he believed, <laughs> but not everything, because he said the Reformation does not really belong to the modern world, but to the medieval world. The real break or divide in what we used to call Western civilization, Trelch argued, came with an enlightenment in the 18th century, not with the Reformation in the 16th century. I think Trelch was right about that. If Luther was the last medieval Christian, then I think we need to see what had happened to the institution of baptism, to Christian initiation, in the preceding millennium before Luther's own baptism in 1483, in the little town of Eisleben. Number one, and maybe the most important thing to say, is that Augustine happened. You can usually tell a lot about a person by the kind of things they put on their wall, either at home or in their office. And if you come to my office at Beeson Divinity School, you will see a rather largish print of St. Augustine. Of course, we don't know exactly what he looked like. This is a medieval, a rather a Renaissance uh, likeness. Shows him at prayer with his bishop's garments and robe and mitre with demons nipping at his heels. Benjamin Warfield famously said that the Reformation was the triumph of Augustine's theology of grace over his doctrine of the church which is why everybody claims Augustine. 
Catholics, Protestants, except maybe some of the Orthodox in the East. He hasn't quite caught on there yet. Luther was baptized on the day after he was born. It was very common. It was the standard way to be baptized in the time of Luther's birth. But Augustine was not baptized until he was 33 years of age. You can still see, if you go to Milan, the octagonal baptistry where he was baptized by St. Ambrose at Easter Vigil in 387. Ambrose tells about baptism in Milan in his treatise, The Mysteries. It involved a number of the things that I described last night, dipping in water, the creed, exorcism, and in Milan, feet washing. Of course, concluding with the Eucharist. There were two major developments related to baptism stemming from Augustine's own work and really from two great controversies that consumed much of his later life. The first was a controversy with the Donatists. The Donatists were a schismatic group in North Africa who emphasized, in fact insisted on, the ritual purity of the minister of baptism. And because of certain schisms and betrayals that had happened in the past, they refused to accept as valid the baptism done by certain ministers who had been involved in betraying the Christian faith in a time of persecution. Augustine, on the other hand, claimed that what really mattered as to the validity of baptism was not the personal holiness of the minister, though of course that's always to be desired, but rather the purity and power of Jesus Christ. And so he set forth a view of the sacraments that came to be known as ex opere operato. It's a Latin phrase that means on the basis of the work worked, literally, as opposed to the Donatist view, ex opere operantis, where it's on the basis of the one who is doing, performing, administering the work, the sacrament. And so from this strong Augustinian emphasis on the objectivity of the work of God in baptism, regardless of the status of the minister, came the idea that baptism imparts a character indelible, an indelible uneradicable character on the one who receives it. It's like a uh, Roman soldier who would receive on the, the back of the right hand what was called a stigma or a punta. It was a brand. It was a tattoo. It marked you as belonging to the Roman army. Well, baptism did the same thing, according to Augustine, for everyone who was baptized. Now, I said there were two controversies. The second one was with the Pelagians. I won't rehearse that controversy much as I'm tempted to, but I assume you good Saturday morning theological students know something about it anyway. With reference to baptism, it had to do with the connection between baptism and original sin. This was not a new problem for Augustine in the 5th century. Origen had wondered how baptism could effect forgiveness for infants who were innocent, who had done nothing wrong when they came forth from the womb at least. Cyprian, whom I mentioned last night, gave an answer to Origen's question. He said that it wasn't their own personal transgressions that needed to be washed away. It was the sin of Adam. What, we came, what, was, what came to be called original sin. 
And this was contracted by their very birth owing to the corruption of their origin. Now, this was in the air. This was talked about by theologians, written about. But it was really St. Augustine who gave this a kind of thoroughgoing and systematic treatment that conveyed it to the subsequent centuries right down to the time of Martin Luther. So infants were to be baptized, though there's very little record of Augustine having baptized many of them. There's one record where a, a woman brings her child, presumably newly born or recently born, to Augustine for baptism. But generally speaking, it's, it's, it's accepted, but not enforced as a universal rule at the time of Augustine, though a rationale had been given for it that would be very important for the subsequent development of baptism. Baptism removes the stain or the guilt, the pain of original sin. It does this by virtue of the fact that Jesus Christ is present there. And there is an objectivity that cannot be mitigated by the wrongdoings of the administrator. Well, what about infants who die before they're able to be baptized? Augustine ponders this question. It's not a slam dunk. But he does come down on the side of the fact that infants who die without the benefit of baptism are not included in those eternally blessed by God in heaven. It's a harsh doctrine. It was in his day. Uh, many would say it still is today, if you know anybody who still holds it. But he didn't want to actually assign them to the tortures of the inferno. Instead, he carved out a new place where infants dying without baptism went at death called Limbus Infantium, Limbo. This is why in the Middle Ages and down to Luther's time and subsequently, especially in Roman Catholic context, it is imperative as soon as possible, using every means conceivable, to have infants baptized right after birth. And so the widespread practice, even to this day in Catholic hospitals, of midwife or nurse baptism, emergency baptism. Now, Augustine's baptismal theology helped the church deal with some pressing pastoral problems at the time. But it also led over time to what I think he did not intend, and that was the diminution and displacement of baptism both in the liturgy and life of the Christian. How did that happen? The centrality of baptism, it seems so evident when you look at baptism as it was practiced in the early church, whether in Rome or North Africa or the East, this was displaced by a kind of what we might call penitential Eucharistic piety. In the early church, baptism, while a complex, multivalent process, nonetheless was a unitary event. Catechesis to Eucharist. With all those elements in various forms that we talked about last night. But over time, this unitary baptismal process that began when the catechumenate started and ended only on Easter Sunday with the Eucharist of the newly baptized Christians, with the whole church, this broke apart. And particularly that, that aspect of the laying on of hands, the anointing by the bishop with oil of the newly baptized Christian, this evolved into a completely different sacrament, confirmation. And so, penance assumed a greater and greater role in the life of the medieval Christian. 
Not that there was no penance in the early church. Of course, there was lots of it. But the idea that baptism removed the stain of original sin, but there remained in every person baptized this tender box of sin. What was it called? The fomes picati. This kindling that's going to spark into a flame and lead you to mortal sin. And the remedy for that, of course, was not to be baptized again, but to go to penance. And that's why in 1215 at the Fourth Lateran Council, annual confession and annual communion were required of all Christians. The objectivity of God's work in the act of baptism was never denied, but it was isolated. The ex opere operato nature of baptism served to ritualize and desiccate baptism by relegating it to the beginning of the Christian life, dealing with the removal of original sin. We can say between uh, the early church and the time Luther was baptized in 1483, that baptism as a sacrament was Augustinianized in the way I've just described. Also, Aristotelianized. I won't go into how that's done, but this whole scholastic schema of causation. Thomas Aquinas is maybe the best representative. Luther charged that the scholastics had reduced the power of baptism to such small and slender dimensions that it had become entirely useless. As usual, Luther is exaggerating in his language. But nonetheless, he has this point. Something has happened to baptism that isn't good. It's been compressed into this event at the beginning of life and divorced from the confirmation process, divorced from the outworking of baptism as it ought to be. Okay. Um, enough medieval background. We've got to get to 1483 if we're going to get any further. Both Luther and Calvin were opposed to a theology based on speculation. In the Institutes, Calvin uh, mentions a trick question. He, he repeats a, a, a joke, actually, that was told by Augustine a thousand years before. It was still funny in the 16th century. It's kind of still funny today. Uh, the, the trick question someone had asked Augustine was that, what was God doing before he made the world? It's a child's question, but not a childish question. Augustine answered with a joke, which Calvin repeated. God was busy creating hell for overly curious people like you. <laughs> it still gets a laugh. What? <clears throat> there are some places you just don't want to go in theology. And a part of that anti-speculative bent for all the reformers was that they rejected a distinction that had become woven into the texture of late medieval theology between God's absolute power and God's ordained power. By his absolute power, it was said, God could have done anything. He could have become incarnate in an ass. They had a whole topic in theology, the Asinus Christology. <laughs> or, uh, to go a little further down on the chain of uh, being, a rock. He could have been a stone instead of a man. By his absolute power, he could even have made the Blessed Virgin Mary to have been a whore. Luther and Calvin uh, thought this was a ridiculous way to think about God and about theology. They wanted to do theology within the limits of revelation alone. And they focused not on what God might have done by some hypothetical absolute power, but what in fact God had done once and for all in His Word and through His Son. <clears throat> 
So Luther says, it's folly to argue much about God outside and before time because this is an effort to understand God without a covering. Because this is impossible, God envelops Himself in His works in certain forms. As today, He wraps Himself in baptism. What does Luther mean when he said God wraps himself in baptism? I want to answer that question by focusing on three big, big topics. So I will only uh, be touching uh, the tips of the mountain peaks as we soar above in our supersonic jet. <laughs> baptism and the Word of God. I think that's where we have to start with Lutheran baptism. Baptism and faith. It's where we have to come eventually with baptism and Luther. And finally, baptism and repentance. So baptism in the Word of God, baptism in faith, and baptism and repentance. Number one, baptism in the Word of God. Throughout the twists and turns of Luther's sacramental theology, initially polemically directed to the Church of Rome, later responding to the attacks of Zwingli and the Anabaptists. So Luther is fighting throughout his life, especially as he goes into the 1520s and 30s, on two fronts. The Roman Catholic Church, medieval sacramental theology, and on the front of Zwingli, the Anabaptists. He lumped these people all together and called them Schrammer. That's a German word that means like a bunch of bees swarming around a hive. The swarmers, the Schrammer. We usually translate that word fanatic. It's a little prejudicial translation, but nonetheless. So when he's fighting against Rome, his emphasis is on the inviolate connection between God and the material sacramental signs, rather, that's the latter, when he's fighting against Zwingli and the Schwermer, that's where he's putting his emphasis. Earlier in his contest with Rome, he talks about the importance of faith. But in both cases, water is involved in baptism. And Luther admits, at one level, this baptismal water is just plain old water. It's like the water a cook would use in the kitchen or like the water that flows by the Elba River in Wittenberg. Just common water. But when sanctified, that's Luther's word, by the Word of God, it becomes a divine, heavenly, and blessed water. Thus, Luther can call the water of baptism the true aqua vitae. A precious sweetened water, aromaticum, and medicine, which comes into existence because God is intermingled with it. Now, it was precisely that kind of talk that scared Zwingli half to death. How was it not the elevation of the creaturely to the level of the divine? the proper name for which is idolatry. Now we think about Luther and Zwingli coming to a great clash over the Lord's Supper at the Colloquy of Marburg in 1529, but long before it came to that, there was this brewing difference between these two great theologians and reformers on the question of baptism. Just as an aside, I think it's helpful to recognize when we're talking about the difference between the Reformed and the Lutheran that for Zwingli and also for Calvin, the great fear against which they are reacting in some ways is the fear of idolatry, of elevating the creature to the level of the Creator. Whereas for Luther, the great fear is presuming on the grace of God. So for Zwingli and Calvin, the specter in the background is paganism. 
For Luther, it's Judaizing the Christian faith. This comes clear in his great commentary on Galatians, 1535. Karl Barth is a latter-day Zwinglian when it comes to baptism. And he summarizes the Reformed soteriological concern when he spoke disparagingly of Luther's Wasser theologie, his water theology. To believe, this is Bart, to believe in Jesus Christ and in water consecrated by his presence is a dangerous thing and is not confirmed by any necessary relationship between the two. If there is a response to this line of criticism from Luther, or from a Lutheran point of view, it is grounded in Luther's dynamic doctrine of God's word as promise, promissio. The word spoken in baptism is no mere human word. It is the same powerful, efficacious word by which God spoke the world into existence, creating out of nothing, ex nihilo, that which was not. And Luther says, if God is able by the word to create heaven and earth, to fill the world and everything that we see with our eyes, why is it not possible for him to take water and baptize And of course, that word of God is concretized in particularly the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oswald Bayer, one of the greatest living Lutheran theologians in my mind, has described the reformational turning point in Luther's theology as his discovery of the word as a means of grace. Or as Luther himself put it, ubi est verbum, ibi est ecclesia. Where the word is, there is the church. That's said in a somewhat different way in Article 7 of the Augsburg Confession, defining the two infallible marks of the church as where the word is rightly preached and the sacraments are duly administered. These are the notes of the church. They're not the only notes of the church. Luther will later explain, expand this list to include things like confession and prayer and praise and the cross and suffering. But they all are connected to these primal notes, the word rightly preached and the sacraments rightly administered. Now, the word of God for Luther takes three forms among the people of God in the church. Oral, written, and sacramental. The oral presentation of the Word of God refers to preaching. Luther says preaching is the most important office in the church. It's more important than officiating at sacraments, he says. More important than prayer. The church is a mouth house, not a pen house. It's a place where people speak and hear, not where you write down things with your pen. And so this hearing, getting this from Romans 10, fides ex altitude, faith on the basis, faith out of hearing, faith comes from hearing. So how can they believe unless they hear? Paul asked that. Ears are the most important organs of the Christian. And this is not so different than what you find in a document like the Second Helvetic Confession, 1566. It comes from Bullinger. The preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. So Luther doesn't want to separate this from what happens in baptism or the Eucharist. Word and sacrament, pulpit and baptismal font and table go together in Luther's Reformation theology and I think also in Calvin's. So the oral word of God in preaching, the written word of God in the scriptures, of course. Luther was doctor in Biblia. That was his official title at the University of Wittenberg. He was an exegete, an expositor of the Bible. 
And he always took seriously and never repudiated his doctoral degree. And the vow he made to be a teacher of the Word of God at the time it was granted. He, now, he, was, he also took a monastic vow. He threw that out the window, married Katie. But his doctoral degree, which was his kind of imprimatur to teach the Word of God, he never gave up that. And so at one point, he says, when Jesus comes back at the end of the age, he will step out on a cloud and he will say, Dr. Martinez, come forth. Even Jesus will call him doctor. <laughs> the written word of God, the Holy Scriptures. And finally, the sacramental word of God, and that's baptism and the Lord's Supper. Of course, the medieval church had seven sacraments. Luther pared them down to two, though he kept absolution confession for a sort of while as a semi-sacrament, maybe. But at the end of the day, sacraments require the dominical institution from Jesus himself, and we have find baptism in the Lord's Supper. I don't know that he ever took a stand on foot washing where Jesus says, do this. But in whichever form the word is active in the church, Luther rejects entirely the paradigm that it is human beings who preach, who threaten, who comfort, who baptize, who offer the supper of the Lord. No, he says, it's, it's the Holy Spirit, God Himself, the Trinitarian reality of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who preaches threatens, punishes, frightens, comforts, baptizes, and offers the sacrament of the altar. Now, so much on the first point, baptism in the Word of God. I'm going now to my second point on Luther, baptism in faith. Luther's first two writings devoted to baptism says very little about baptism in his pre-Reformation writings. A few references here or there. But the first two treatises devoted to baptism are the Holy and Blessed Sacrament of Baptism from 1519 and a very long section in his 1520 treatise on the Babylonian captivity of the church. One of Luther's three great 1520 treatises. In both of these documents, Luther challenges the medieval sacramental doctrine of ex opere operato. That grace is conferred by the sheer performance of the act. He opposes that with another opposite doctrine. Nullum sacramentum sine fide. There is no sacrament without faith. Now, the great d debate when Luther experienced his, as to when Luther experienced his famous breakthrough to the doctrine of justification by faith alone, you have scholars arguing as early as 1512 and others more 1518, 19. I belong to the latter camp. But regardless of that, it's clear that this baptismal maturation in Luther's thinking took place in the context of all of the events that were swirling about him, the indulgence controversy of 1517, the Heidelberg Disputation of 1518, his 1519 sermon on the two kinds of righteousness in which he sets forth really for the first time with great clarity justification by faith alone and the imputation of Christ's alien righteousness. And I think it's no coincidence that it was in the wake of this theological revolution that Luther produces these seminal works on baptism, stressing the necessity of faith. The sacrament of baptism for Luther is the liturgical enactment of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. But what does Luther mean when he says, nullum sacramentum sine fide? Without faith there is no sacrament. The Word of God ever remains the enabling constituent in baptism as Christ is present in, with, and under the elements of bread and wine in the Eucharist, Luther says. So too He is present in, with, and in the midst of 
the baptismal water. And, and so you get this Bart Zwingli reaction to such language. But for Luther, this does not work ex opere operato, as the medievals thought, but only through faith. Now, Luther's statement on the necessity of faith with respect to baptism are too numerous to quote. And so I won't quote them. Well, all of them. But um, I will give you just one to give you a taste. Faith alone makes the person worthy to receive this salutary divine water beneficially. I'm talking about baptism. For since this is presented and promised here in the words by and with the water, it cannot be received otherwise than by our believing it from our hearts. Without faith, baptism benefits nothing. And he quotes there Mark 16, the famous verse, he, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, who does not believe will be damned. Or in the Babylonian captivity of the church, unless faith is present or is conferred in baptism, come to that in just a minute, baptism will profit us nothing. To be baptized without faith is to accuse God's promise of being a lie, which is the greatest of all sins. Now, there is a sense, of course, in which no one from the Catholics to the Anabaptists deny faith and baptism are in some sense correlative. In fact, scholastic theology in which Luther was trained, which he got his doctorate, distinguished all kinds of faith. There was fides informis. That's a faith that, unformed faith, that can coexist with mortal sin. There is fides formata, faith active in love. There is fides implicita. This is a habitual belief in what the church teaches, implicit faith. Fides explicita, the conscious and explicit assent of the mind to Catholic truth. Fides qua, Q-U-A-E, the content of faith. Fides qua, Q-U-A, the act of faith. Fides acquisita, fides infusa, credulitas, on and on and on, and fiducia, which is trust in the promises of God. And it is this aspect of faith that Luther puts in so much of his emphasis on, fiducia. Fiducial faith is personal, Trust, reliance, a grasping or taking hold of Christ. It's very different from the Catholic view of faith formed by love, in which faith is a theological virtue, one of the three, to which love becomes the means for its growth and increment, leading finally to final justification. Fiducial faith, on the other hand, is active, living, dynamic. It is a radical gift of grace and it is inherently personal, which is why Luther keeps repeating those two Latin words, pro me. Jesus Christ has died for me. Let no one hope to be saved through another's faith or work, Luther says. This cannot be done even through the Virgin Mary or any saint's work. No, not even through Christ's work and faith, but only through your own faith. For if you yourself do not have faith, God will not permit Mary or any other saint or even Christ himself to substitute for you in such a way that you are pious and just. Now, how does the requirement of faith that Luther stresses so strongly, especially in this early period of his work, how does this relate to the baptism of infants? Since the time of Anselm and Bernard of Clairvaux in the Middle Ages, it had been common to teach that infants were baptized on the vicarious faith of their godparents. Luther rejects this belief. And he also rejects the belief that infants are baptized on the basis of their presumed 
future faith. Though infants certainly can be helped by the prayers of their parents and godparents and sponsors, and indeed one should pray for the baptized infants that they might fully claim and enter into the meaning of their baptism, grow and mature in Christ. Yes, Luther acknowledges all that's important. But it's not on the basis of the faith of someone else that they themselves are baptized, but their own faith. So Luther comes up with, I say he comes up with, I'm not saying he invented it out of whole cloth, but it is a distinctive doctrine of fides infancia, the faith of infants, their own personal faith. How do they get this faith? Well, it's infused into them by God. They're not even aware of it, of course. They're infants. And that makes them all the more ready recipients because they don't have all this reason, thinking, questioning, doubting going on in their mind like grown-up people do. Setting obstacles before God's infusion of faith. No, they're just there receiving it from God on the basis of His promise in His Word. Now, Luther, this is present already, this infant faith idea in Luther's early writings. It's in the Babylonian captivity of the church. But it becomes much more prominent in his later writings on baptism when he's concerned to confront Zwingli and the Anabaptists. I don't have time to get into that part of the story because I want to go to my third big point, baptism and repentance. The, Baptist, uh, the Reformation did not begin with a struggle over baptism, but with a dispute about the sacrament of penance, specifically the sale of indulgences. And you know this story very well. Johannes Tetzel, a Dominican monk, came into Luther's territory on the other side of the river in Saxony, teaching uh, when the coin in the coffer rings, the souls from Purgatory Spring, and you pay your money, and you get your voucher, and it works that way, the commercializing of God's grace and forgiveness. Luther protested this um, as a pastor. He was concerned about the, the flock of which God had placed him uh, being fleeced, literally, by this kind of manipulative uh, selling of God's divine mercy and grace, at least as it was being presented. There is another theology of indulgences that tries to avoid that, but that clearly wasn't what get, was getting through to the people. Luther knew that. And so he writes the 95 Theses to set forth his own understanding of indulgences. Now, at one level, this is just a small little problem. Okay, pastors have all kinds of problems. You know, they've got to go deal with this or that. And, and so uh, this is why down in Rome, when they heard about it, they thought, oh, this is just a little monk's quarrel. Luther's an Augustinian, Tetzel's a Dominican. They're up there in Germany quarreling over this little, not even secondary, tertiary problem. What's so, such a big deal about it? But of course, that little problem, someone once said that a nuance in an ideological difference is a great chasm. And that little pastoral problem soon opened up into a raging controversy about sin and grace, faith and works, scripture and tradition, papal authority and all the rest. And you get the Reformation. Now, the word baptism is not mentioned even once in the 95 Theses. But the first of the 95 Theses goes to the heart of Luther's teaching on baptism in the Christian life. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. This term repent in the Vulgate was penitentium agite, do penance. Luther was working on these 95 Theses just at the time he received from Basel the newly published Greek edition of the New Testament, the first ever published critical edition of the New Testament by Erasmus, published by Froben in Basel in 1516, 
somebody brings one to Luther, he begins to delve into it and studies especially this phrase in the Gospel of Matthew, metanoete, repent. And he comes to understand this is not what the church has been teaching about the sacrament of penance, something you have to do, a pilgrimage, an offering, uh, some ascetic work, do penance. It rather has to do with a change of your mind and heart, with your being turned around from self-absorption toward the reality of a God of grace. Now, in medieval scholastic understanding, I've already said this, baptism removed the guilt and stain of original sin, but this tinderbox of sin remained leading you to mortal sin without the interposition of additional grace through the sacrament of penance, which itself was divided into many different parts. I don't have time to go into that. This, this was not new. This was not invented by Thomas Aquinas. It was an extrapolation out of an idea that Luther traced back to St. Jerome in the early church, who understood penance as a second plank. The idea is that you're on a ship in the ocean, it's about to go down uh, and you get a second plank. After baptism comes penance. Hold on to penance. That's your second plank. Well, of course, this was precisely Luther's problem in the monastery. I tried to live according to the rule with all diligence. I used to be contrite to confess numbers of my sins, repeated confession, on and on and on. And yet my conscience would never give me certainty. But I always doubted and said, you did not perform correctly. You were not contrite enough. You left that out of your confession. The more I tried to remedy an uncertain, weak, and afflicted conscience with the traditions of men, the more each day found it more uncertain, weaker, and troubled. Luther found relief, eventually, by turning, as he said, to the wounds of Jesus, which his great teacher, Johann von Staupitz, encouraged him. Look to the wounds of Jesus, what Jesus Christ has once for all done for you on the cross. Believe in that. Trust in that. And he applies that to baptism to say, baptism is not a simple punctiliar event that can be confined to the past. Washing away the stain of original sin at baptism. Rather, it remains a present reality throughout the entire life of the believer. That's what Luther's doctrine of baptism in the Christian life is all about. And so we can use language like this. Christians are being continually baptized in Christ. Now he doesn't mean, of course he doesn't mean that you keep going again and again and again and again to be baptized, baptized, and re-re-baptized. He means that the effect of baptism is perduring throughout the Christian life. It's not just something that happens when an infant is baptized. It is something that provides a resource and the presence of God for the entire Christian life until the day you die. Luther rejects the medieval isolation of baptism as the static entrance to the Christian life and elongates its reality, extending to the point of death. And so that's where I got the title for this lecture from the Large Catechism, 1527. We must always be baptized more and more, Luther says, until we fulfill the sign of baptism, dying and rising again, in our own physical, mortal death and the resurrection at the end of the age when Jesus comes again, says Dr. Martinez. So there is a lasting connection between baptism and repentance. Thesis one. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, He meant the entire life to be one of turning, returning, again and again and again, being baptized more and more, returning to our baptism daily, 
Um, I wanted to read you something that's by a Lutheran, a person who's a theologian, a scholar, who grew up in the Lutheran tradition. It's kind of a personal testimony of how this worked in, in his formation. For Luther, baptism signifies that the old creature in us is to be drowned and die through daily repentance. And that daily a new person is to come forth and arise up to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Early on, the brunt of this call by Luther to be born again daily and his recitation of Romans 6 did not shake or shake me. I was nurtured in a home where this way of life was taken for granted. And he goes and talks about his schooling and his training. And then he says, While I did not and still do not seek a Luther-like emotional trauma and a shattering onrush of new experiences, still I learned from Luther to put this understanding of the dailiness of baptism in my life. When I've been tempted, when I've been in doubt or depression or near despair, I would remind myself as Luther did, baptizatus sum, I am baptized. Well, I'm glad there are Lutherans who still read Luther and think about what he meant. So, that being baptized more and more the Christian life is nothing less than a daily baptism once begun, constantly lived in leads Luther in certain ways to um, deal with the stresses that come to every Christian life. Uh, like the onfectungen. That's Luther's word for, not temptation, that's how we usually translate it. It's too weak. means, well, onfectungen, the root word there is the German word fecten, which means to fence. Some of you do fencing, you know what that is? We're trying to stab somebody, I guess. Uh, it's, a, it's a term from gladiators, from combat. And so onfectungen are the spiritual attacks, the bouts of dread, the assaults of despair that again and again confront the Christians. So when Luther was in the Wartburg Castle translating the New Testament into German from Erasmus' Greek text, the devil would come with all kinds of temptations and questions and who are you to do this? Are you the only one who's been right in 1,500 years, etc., etc.? And Luther would say to the devil, he spoke to the devil, Baptizatus sum, I am baptized. I have been baptized. Baptism grabs the devil by the throat and the old Adam by the collar and gives us tremendous resources in the spiritual conflict in our life. Well, I'm, I was going to mention two others. I'm going to stop because my hour is just about over. I was going to talk about baptism and prayer, the importance Luther placed on morning and evening prayer, and also on the sign of the cross. As a extension, in a sense, of baptism and useful in our combat with the evil one. Luther kept exorcism in his baptismal liturgy in 1523 and 1526. It later dropped out of Lutheranism. It's a great loss. Uh, and also the same of the, of the Apostles' Creed on a daily basis. This was a part of formation that comes from baptism. But I've got to say just a word about singing because this is such a wonderful singing church. Uh, Pastor Lusk is here and he won't mind me, I think, saying to you all, if you've never been to worship here, you must come. The sermons are great and the singing is also fantastic. I know, I've, I've been here and they sing. Luther was a singer, a musician, 
And he wrote a great hymn on baptism. I'm not going to sing it, though you should try to sing it sometime. I don't think there's anything in here good Presbyterians couldn't say. I don't think. Um, but I will quote a couple of stanzas and then I'll be done. To Jordan came our Lord the Christ to do God's pleasure willing. And there was by St. John baptized all righteousness fulfilling. There he did consecrate a bath to wash away transgression and quench the bitterness of death by his own blood and passion. A new life he would give us. So here you all and well perceive what God has named baptism and what a Christian should believe who error shuns in schism that we should water use the Lord made known His pleasure not simple water, water but with the word and spirit without measure. He is the true baptizer. I'll just give you the last stanza here. There's seven stanzas to this hymn that I've got. All that the mortal eye beholds in water as man pours it before the eye of faith unfolds the power of Jesus' merit. Faith sees the flooding fountain red. Luther elsewhere speaks of the red rosy water of baptism. Faith sees the flooding fountain red stained with the blood of Jesus which from the sins inherited from fallen Adam free us and those we have committed. Okay, Luther singing about baptism. I think my time has come and gone, so we'll uh, move to our next phase.